So you may have seen canyoning on this channel, but have you ever wondered how to get into it? I have done several canyons and I still don't feel like I could go canyoning by myself. And you shouldn't, you should go with somebody who knows what they're doing, but at least be a good follower to somebody who is leading. This is going to help you go from either a climbing background or no background to being able to go do your first canyon. I'm Sean Bro. I've been canyoning for about 10 years. Been in the, the climbing and mountaineering community for about 20, 30 years. Getting into canyoning is uh, kind of a roadblock for a lot of people. So we're gonna figure out how the best way to do that. I think this is the best foundational value that we can give you guys is like, let's just kind of start at the basics. There are other courses out there. There are some basic courses, some advanced stuff. We have our own 10 video series with Brent Roth where we get into like the niche on how to do different types of rappelling. So that's what canyoners do. They rappel, but they do it well. I'm so Ryan, you obviously have gone canyoning, right? I've done uh, maybe 10 different canyons with okay. Brent and Seth to this point. There's still such a mystery for me on how to go not that I'd ever go without you, Brent. I'm just saying, <laughs> if you were busy. Uh, he's always busy. He's always busy. When am I qualified? What's not safe for me? And with a climbing background, especially with that, what am I capable of doing? Right, you may have a very good skill set. Yeah. But a matter of applying that skill set to what's applicable in the canyon. And then sometimes you may not really know what you don't know. And then you get into a situation that you might get in trouble. That you realize how much you don't know. Yeah. The older I get, the more I realize how little I know. So I'm not just diving right into it like I did big Wally and I just threw myself on El Cap and paid for it. What's the difference in canyoning and canyoneering? So that was a good question that I had for a long time. And, and so I've uh, gone canyoning uh, in the Northwest and I've gone canyoneering in the Colorado Plateau, Utah uh, area. And so what I've kind of figured out and just in the community, C-class, you know, it's canyoning, and if you're in an AAB class, it's canyoneering, but it's kind of geographical as well. Wet versus dry. I've really only done wet canyons where you're really wet. You're going from pool to pool to pool and rappelling in waterfalls. The areas that I would actively avoid rappelling as a climber, they actively seek the hardest spot to rappel and then have meetings about how they can do it as safe as possible. <laughs> It's hilarious. Cause I'm like, if you just repel off that tree, none of this is applicable. Yeah. There's ways to go down a waterfall and not necessarily be in the flow, you know, so you can, can you know, can go down next to it. But then the biggest thing is like, if I'm gonna be in flow, right, and I get stuck. So there's things you gotta worry about there. How can you get stuck? Um, so you can get things caught in the uh, device, right? Um, your sure. shirt, your hair, your whistle, whatever. I mean, if anything's getting caught in there, right? So if you're in heavy flow and something gets stuck, then that's gonna be a big issue. Sometimes be able to self-rescue yourself, right? Either to, to a climb out of that, climb up the rope again, or to you know, cut yourself free. Remember, you're, you're drowning. Yeah. You're, you're, being, you're being waterboarded. Waterboarded, yeah. And that's no fun, it's no fun. I've inverted actually one time in a waterfall and uh, that was was not fun but and then you have the hazards of down below so so like my landing into a deep pool um is there hydraulics down there are there any hazards you know that you have to worry about so there's a lot more than just repelling down um the waterfall and then also when you have a waterfall access to the anchor is also a factor so sometimes access to the anchor is 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 difficult yeah because the best anchors are going to be kind of the steepest part. So you can pull the rope without it rubbing, repel without the rope rubbing, but then that's also the sketchiest thing to get out to. Yeah, is if you have your anchor further away from the uh, crown, uh, you're actually gonna be in the heavy flow, right? Because, it, because it's all going through a pinch point typically. So if you're back here and you're going over, you're gonna be in heavy flow as to where if you can get the anchor or kind of along the wall on the side of the uh, crown, then you can potentially avoid most of the heavy flow you know, and go down next to it. What is the hazard in maybe uh, a dry desert environment other than gravity? If the canyons in Utah, you have a big pothole. Those potholes can be full of water. I and mean, even if there's no flow, there's hazards of just being in the water on a rope. And then sometimes if those potholes are empty, there was uh, an accident not too long ago where they got down into the, the pothole and couldn't get out. They pulled the rope? They uh, pulled the rope and couldn't get out of the pothole. Right, so then what do you do, I right? Mean, I've never, I guess, entered that situation. Yeah, 
Yeah, so there's... That makes sense. Yeah, there's so, uh, hazards yeah. in all of them that you have to kind of be aware of. And so, like, if you're just looking at a topo, you know, and it's like, well, there's, you know, cliff bands or there's a canyon through here, you know, I know how to get through a rappel, you know, then it's, you know, not too hard. But there's, there's the other hazards, you know, that you have to worry about. Not every climb is free soloing El Capitan, Mom. So <laughs> not every canyon is the dangerous, deadly stuff. Correct. What are the levels of them? How are they rated? How could I decide if something's beginner level if I wanted to take a stab at it? You have like, you know, uh, one through four. The lower the level, the easier it is. Uh, like a one kind of, you know, just a hike through the narrows. I mean, a two would maybe be some, you know, some uh, rock scrambling, some down climbs. Mm. And you get into three, right? So three is a more technical. There's either jumps, slides, rappelling down climbs that you may need a buddy assist right or it could be a pothole that you need you know to not get stuck right in. so you need to not get stuck in right so you need some sort of gear and a little bit extra uh, experience four is even more beyond that right and then even within those ratings there's you know there's a different classification there's also the a b and c's and the one two three fours is the time one versus a three you know it's going to take you know a two hours versus you know like a six hours r rated or x rated right so that's either more technical is x rated when you have walls on both sides you can't escape once you enter um or you're like if you can't get through you're gonna die so X-rated, depending on where you're at uh, geographically as well, right? So like an X-rated canyon in Escalante in, in uh, Utah, it's usually where you're stemming in be between two walls with an abyss below you. Gotcha. So if you were to fall, you're going to die or get, and get severely stuck, right? So some of those canyons you just have to get through. They're safe if you have the skill set and the agility to do it, but you know, you'll be stemming across walls with you know a lot of space below you That's so like a x. chimney that would be like an x yeah and an r is more like you got to know how to do a, a guided repel something like that yeah like where they, it's a guided repel or a little bit more technical it could be like where there's an exposed um you know anchor or something that's a little bit more out of the ordinary you know so if you're new to the sport i would look at threes fours that don't have you know, a R rating or X rating with it. If you're looking at fours, I would definitely go with a guide or someone that's highly experienced. For me, I, I come with this climbing background. I feel like I could handle a, a, a beginner level thing where I'm using ropes, maybe not just a walk through the narrows, but like I'm repelling something. What could I rating wise look at? A three? If I wanted to go yeah. with me and somebody equal to my level, but not a canyoneer. A three in the Northwest and a three down in Utah is different. Um, so a three could mean water. You can have a three C or a three A or a three B, mm. right? So A is completely dry, typically. Uh, A's could still be, you know, have gotcha. had pothole. B is how much water? Standing water, no flow, typically. Okay. Or a super low flow. Uh, canyon right so it's like c is when you have to worry about hydraulics and all the other stuff i'm looking for maybe a three b two hours but there's obviously information in there i need where am i going to find three b two hour type canyons near me so uh here in the northwest uh we uh, utilize a uh, rope wiki a lot besides rope wiki what else is there or is rope wiki for the whole world yeah i think rope wiki is probably one of the most commonly used you also have a road trip ryan which has a lot of good information for arizona and utah there's blue gnome has some but yeah rope wiki i think is the most broad a used one. Okay, so this is the Rope Wiki page. So you can click on regions. So you can click on the main map, or I like to go down here to North America. Okay, so go. Pacific Northwest. Yep. And then even with that, Idaho, Oregon, Washington. So Washington. let's go to Washington. Break it up into the North Cascades or the Olympic Peninsula, wherever you want to go. Ones, right? So like these white ones are ones that people have identified, but no one's actually run them yet. Mm. So don't run those ones unless you're... <laughs> don't run those if yeah. you're new. <laughs> if you go underneath the, the map, there's a list as well. The Dingford, that... yep. Let's take a look at that real quick. Okay. Now, I don't think Dingford's the first thing you should be running, but uh, since I've been down it, I think it'll be nice to see what this says about it. So yeah. I know how to interpret what I'm seeing. 
Because if you're going with a guide who's done it a tons of times, a Dingford as a new person oh, would be fun. would be super fun, right? It's it, like it's a water park for adults. So difficulty says three C three, a level three. Correct. C is super wet. Three point five to nine hours. Yeah. So the approach says here thirty to forty five minutes. The exit says two minutes. So you exit near the car, and then you end up hiking uphill to the start. Correct. Yeah. So. <sighs> Some canyons you're gonna start at the bottom and mm -hmm. have to hike up, and then you know other canyons you could start at the top and go down and then have to hike back up. Okay. Photos in there for gauging the water levels. Moderate, challenging but not dangerous for intermediate canyoneers. In a good rainy season, a canyon like this is gonna be high all the way probably into August. Yeah, we don't usually run it early. Yeah, it's, it's there's a lot of water. It's always flowing pretty high. So the detailed description. J, J is for one. jumps, R is for rappel. When they um, say one, that's the first one, right? Correct. Why and do they, they both say one? So there's the first jump and the first a rappel, right? So then you have mm -hmm. the second rappel and then your second jump. What's S3 and S4? Oh. So S is slide yeah. or, I mean, if you're in, in Europe, it's a toboggan. So like the up above there's uh, S2 and then the beta for um, slide three and slide four is all together. So down here, it says R16. That isn't 16 separate steps. That is the 16th rappel. Correct. You have been sliding and jumping up to this point. Right. I look for Rock Creek and you're right there. This is a newer one that's been um, 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 opened up. It says approach is zero minutes, which means you are you're, uh, parking you're where you start. Rigging up at the car, yeah. So you're rigging up up top and then there's a rappel and then you're gonna have to hike back up. So this is a 3C2. So go down and see how many repels. Oh, uh, that's a lot less. I mean, so if you look at R1, you're right, it's a it's a repel or a jump. Ah, that's how they right? distinguish that. Depends on the flow, mm -hmm. uh, the water levels, right? And it changes from week to week. And if you, you know, feel comfortable jumping it. Right, and if you're <laughs> you are comfortable, right? So um, sometimes it could be more of a technical jump where you got to jump in a very specific spot, and you know. So if you don't know that, or if you don't know for sure how deep it is, and then then you're going to repel. So if you're going down a canyon you're not familiar with, usually you'll have somebody scout out the jump, make sure it's deep enough. Even if you have beta from the week before, right? I, mean, I would send your first person down on repel, right? Mm -hmm. Or I mean, however they can get down check the depth yeah right and make sure it's it's good for everybody else if in doubt always go down and check it out in doubt check it out on here where it says red tape and it crosses briefly under private timberland some landowners are aware and okay with the canyoneers coming on some are not and so usually that's pretty well updated okay so this is how i can find different places to go in the beta mm -hmm. Start small and work your way up. It's probably yeah. good advice. Yeah. Uh, how do I find friends? Typically, most people right now go to Facebook. Do you post on there, I'm going to go here and see if somebody wants to come? Or do you just like scour there and be like, try to swoop in on somebody else's project? So as long as you say, hey, like I'm new, I am I want to learn. Um, most people are going to recommend that you attend a course. If you're brand new, that's super helpful to learn in person someone's trying to make a business out of it, support them. If you're somewhat experienced, comfortable with a few uh, canyons and you're wanting to expand your network, you know, then you can invite other people to canyons that you're doing. At your level. At your You'll level, right? you somebody yeah. higher level. And then, yeah, and then as you meet people, and then some people will invite you, you know, to another canyon, Wait, right? be a friend to make a friend? Yeah, yeah, right. This is a... Descender. Fancy descender. Let's talk about the gear. You own Glacier Black. That is correct. I do. We're trying to make uh, innovative gear, descenders, ropes, uh, and whatever else we can innovate. Now that I have a store, I carry everything he makes. Let's start with this. This is a fancy descender. Why can't I just use the ATC that I currently own as a climber? Uh, and if you're just coming off of a big wall or a multi-pitch climb, an ATC with a fat nylon rope works great. <laughs> fat nylon rope. <laughs> The guy sells eight fives, so let's just be real here. Why I don't want to use this is that when I propel down into a pool of water, I want to be able to get off my rope and swim away. This is going to take a lot of work to get off of while I'm getting chundered in the white stuff. That's 
sucks. This is the first device I actually ever used. Yeah. Because you just gave it to Brent right, right as I met Brent. Which was just perfect. Which is why I have it on my shirt. I just assumed everyone had them. So the Canyon devices are based off of a figure eight style, right? So before we had ATCs, so back before we used ATCs regularly, we used figure eight. So there's a number of times I would rappel with the figure eight, uh, even when I was climbing. But yeah, so that works great. Um, a lot of people still use this. The issue with this is you can't add friction as easily on the fly. You gotta plan ahead. So whatever mode you put it in, is the mode you're getting all the mode way Mode you're down. gonna get, right? There's okay. ways you can can have an extra carabiner to rig where you have kind of a Z rig to add more friction, but you gotta plan ahead. So there's nothing yeah. on the fly. We have some Canyon specific devices with horns or ways to add friction while you're on rappel. I mean, as I use these devices, I had experienced some issues that I didn't like that I wanted to be able to have more friction options, adjust my friction, and kind of customize depending whether I had a light person, a heavy person that I was going with, I came up with this design here. There's a lot of ways to add friction. There's a lot of ways to lock it off. Brent and I tested not only the device, but how much friction this adds as you add more and more wraps to it. And that's part of the uh, rope systems canyon course that we did earlier. This carabiner is hard to get on and off. Why is that? There's an O-ring in there that will allow the device to stay in place a little bit more stable than if I didn't have the O-ring. The red one does not. So the red one it. currently does not. Right, so this will move all over and it can get stuck in various places and cross load. A lot of the Canyon specific devices have an O-ring as well. My fit is a little bit tighter as I just wanted it to be a little bit more snug. This bag has a bottom. Most bags do, but this one doesn't. His bags are half off because they only <laughs> have a side. Are they twice as much because they have less material? Right, yeah. Like a bikini. Brent's my first exposure to canyoning and he loves these bags. What's nice about a double-ended rope bag, sometimes if you get a little bit more technical aspects of, uh, of rigging where you need to set up a, a traverse line uh, and you have access to the other end, right? You don't have to have two ropes. So basically gives you two rope ends to access. If you have a 70 meter rope here, as a climber, I take my entire rope the entire time, every time, and I throw the entire thing off. Uh, you don't do that if you have a 30 foot rope. I know I'm mixing metrics here. I pull out what I need. You pull out what you need and you leave the rest of the meters in the bag. Right. And so typically if I have a single end and I want to have a rope for rescue, right, I have to have two ropes. So if I'm on a 60 foot rappel and I have a 229 foot uh, rope, um, I mean, I can access both the sides of the rope. Now I have two ropes in one where I can have that for, for rescue or for a traverse line. Um, and so it's cleaner at the anchors, less rope I gotta carry and have out. Yeah, you have access to both ends and of your rope. If I need to add pull cord, right? So if I'm on a 150 foot rappel and I have a 200 foot rope, I have to add another 100 foot of uh, the pull cord, right? So then- you mean 200 and 200. Yeah. And you're, your main rope was only 220 something. Right, and so now I'm pulling out my extra rope. I got to get to the end so I can tie the end of my pull cord yeah. to that. As where if I have this, I just flip it over. I access the end, I tie. They have drawstrings. It's so it has a drawstring and it's closed at the bottom until you need it open. And so it's a bag sphincter. <laughs> yes, I will never see these the same. <laughs> a lot of people go out of their way to make their bags waterproof. You've got a lot of holes in your bag. And I'm gonna put more in there too. So this is a prototype <laughs> I'm working on. You wanna have drainage. Uh, so if you're even, if you're in a B class or a C class, you don't wanna be a lugging around. It's going to get wet. It's gonna get wet. And this one has mesh all the mm -hmm. way down to the bottom. So this will drain eventually. Yeah. So like it's, I mean, this bag drains pretty well still. The double-ended drains really, really well. Uh, and the reason why I have a drainage on the sides is like if I pick it up any other way, it's gonna drain water no matter what. And I don't have one of those bags. What could I take as a climber with normal climbing stuff? What could I take down with me? I'll see coiled ropes in the canyon every once in a while. And when you're dealing with that at the anchor, it's just a mess, right? So Especially when you 
a lot of the rappels we're doing weren't that high. No. And so if you're dealing with 40, 50 foot, yeah. a ton, and you even have a 100 foot rope, dealing with that coil, uncoil all the time, I've done that yeah. once. And I was like, no, never again. I'm going to get a rope bag or yeah. work out. So, but if you have a backpack, you can, can flake it into your backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you pull out what you need right up for the rappel. Leave everything else in your backpack. Small backpack or something would work. We have 10 videos on how to do this. This is not that. <laughs> this is how to identify what you come up to as a passenger, whether or not to check to see if it's safe for you. You should always evaluate for something yourself. The difference between a static and releasable. If it's static, it's gonna be a lot harder for them to help you. If it's releasable, you might have a little hope. I'm gonna pull out my one end. Feed it through your anchor first. This is a unlinked double bolt anchor station. Feed it through both. And then we're gonna pull out our amount of rope we need, okay? And throw that down. I like to keep the extra rope in the bag, whether you're using a rope bag or backpack, uh, that way it's out of the way and no one can accidentally grab it. So a static block could be as simple as a clove hitch on a carabiner, okay, on the spine. If, that's a static block there. If you show up and see that, they're, they're not gonna be releasing you. So that's not releasable, right? And then if I have to haul you back up, I have to convert this to a haul or convert this to a lower, which is gonna take extra time. Works very well, it's quick, efficient, but it is limited. Brent has a great demonstration on how to rig an eight mule overhand or an EMO, which is pre-rigging for a potential rescue, which it's blocked off unless you need to be able to lower somebody, which is also beneficial if you want to move the rub point on a rope, which is nice when your diameters are getting thinner and thinner these days. An eight mule overhand, start just like every other system or run the end of the rope through the rappel ring first. And since this is a blocking system, this is gonna go on the backside, not on the rappel strand. I like to hold the eight up in the orientation that I want it to be in once I'm done rigging. I'm gonna reach through the large hole, grab a bite, put it over the end of the eight. I like to put an extra wrap in so I have a little bit more friction in the system before tying it off. So I go over the end of that, pass a bite of rope through the large hole. Through that bite of rope, I grab the strand again, and this is what creates the mule portion of the EMO, eight mule overhand. Pull this slack down until I have enough of the bite here to tie an overhand knot. You, you can tell that this is tied correctly because this loop should be in line with the strand that you tied it around. So once I have the eight mule overhand properly tied, I want to secure this with a draw, I'm gonna put a carabiner in the small hole that prevents any of these bites from slipping off the end, and then also attach this back to the anchor. So this does two functions. It keeps the end of the rope from coming off the small end, in the event if somebody does rig on the wrong strand and pulls down on this, the eight is still secure to the anchor. Okay, if I load this and you wanna lower me, how would you undo it? So to lower, from an EMO, I'm gonna start by untying the overhand. And once that I, I have that untied, I wanna maintain control of this brake strand until this loop comes out. Once that pops, I've got that extra bend still on that eight to give me a little bit more friction and I can start feeding this around. If there's too much friction in there and I wanna reduce it, I need to remove that carabiner to go to the lowest friction possible. And that's low friction mode. We're gonna be talking in a, our Canyon Bolt video about, about the orientation of these. Yes, this is putting all the force on, mostly all the force, on the higher bolt, but that's okay. Bolts that are healthy looking are super strong enough, and you've got this one a few inches away. You don't need to necessarily link them, though there are ways to do that. You can see that in the Canyon course. You don't want to permanently link something that is permanently unlinked if it's in like a flowing canyon or debris could catch that nylon sling and rip those bolts out of the rock or flatten the hanger or something. So don't just throw webbing on everything you see. Uh, if there's a potential for flash or high flow, uh, it's better to have the least amount of webbing or 
non-linked anchors. Even, even chain. Don't go in there and add yeah. chain to it. If it's going to potentially in high flow season, catch debris. You're going to go through the big head into the carabiner. Right? So this is... That's go mode right That's there. go mode, right? So, and the reason why it's like this, as opposed to like a figure eight where it's looped around, when you get to the bottom, you're in water, all you do is pull it and, and walk out. So your disconnect is, is quick. So we're gonna lock it off. Have a couple of friction settings in there. So you can go into that, into here, and then you can come across and you can lock half hitch there, or you can come all the way up and you have a half hitch with a cleat. So that is a hard lock, hands-free lock. And that way you can pull on this, unclip yourself, right. fix something, right. get the bag off your back you no longer want. Right. And you're not going to fall. It usually unlocks pretty easily, right? So you can unlock it and you can just pull this down um, and you still have friction on here. If you had done this a few different ways, right, to lock it off then you're going to have even more friction, right? So when I come off, I've got three modes. So that's one, two, three to be out. So you're gonna come off in a controlled manner. You're not gonna slip and fall. And then you're ready to repel in whatever you're setting you're comfortable with. Before we get into new rigging systems and you going out and trying something for the first time, I wanna go back and go over some fundamentals in repelling that uh, will save your life someday and one of your friend's lives. And it's very important that you go through some sort of process before getting on repel. As you can see in canyoneering, some of the rigging systems can be a little confusing and you may have more than one rope going down the pitch. Um, so coming up with a process that the V7 Academy refers to as a technical process is a good way to ensure you're gonna be safe in a canyon. Ideally, the rigging manager will have identified some sort of attachment point when they do their rigging. Um, it's nice to have a different color carabiner or something that's distinctly different, that's easy to see, that the people in the group know, often referred to as a master carabiner. The first thing that I wanna do when I step up to the pitch, if I'm not coming off of a traverse or hand line, is clip into that. Ideally, if you're not sure, ask the rigging manager and they'll tell you where to clip into. But that's the first thing I want to do is secure myself with a personal attachment system uh, that should be made out of a dynamic rope or lanyard of some kind designed for this purpose. So I'm going to clip in. Second thing I'm going to do is load up my rappel device. I'll load up my rappel device and then choose my preferred friction mode. And I want to pull up on that rappel device until my lanyard is slack and then do some sort of hard lock or soft lock on my device and settle into the anchor. And you can see things starting to move, but this ensures that the rope system is safe before disconnecting myself from the anchor. This really does prevent a potential fall if something were to go wrong here. So I load, test the system first. Once I'm satisfied with the system, I can remove my personal attachment anchor then unlock my device and continue on my repel. Off rope. A key thing to point out here is using locking carabiners in a drop type configuration makes a big difference. I don't want to use a standard quick draw that has non-locking carabiners. I want to be sure that it's going to hold and I'm not going to have somebody have a fatal accident. So here's a few things to keep in mind when going out and starting to rig for your first time, using the technical process, using locking carabiners, and backing up your systems. For more information on this, check out the V7 Online Academy. It goes over a great level one course that has all this information and more. Uh, to go out on your first canyon, and the best part, it is free. So check it out. What could I do to be a good passenger? Help with carrying gear through the canyon. Is uh, flaking the ropes in the bag helpful, or is it like... If you know what you're doing. Or is the leader always pulling it, and it's maybe helpful for me to just hold it open for them? I think the key would just be to ask the leader what you can can do to help. And as you uh, show what you know, you know, they'll usually start to delegate, you know, get various things. Is, 
you know, they don't want to do it all themselves. Yeah. It's also just a general rule. Be self-sufficient. Have your food and water. Right. Uh, water could just be a water squeezy filter if you're in flowy yeah. water, which I thought that was one of the coolest parts about canyoning. Yeah. If you bring a water filter... Because I didn't have to never, carry water with me. You never me. run out of... No, I, I was carrying a lot of water with me. It was just inside of my wetsuit. Right. What's your... Uh, <laughs> Is that water? Are you sure that was water? It uh, started as water <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Do I need a very specific canyoning wetsuit or can I get like a surfing one? Yeah, honestly, so most of my wetsuits are all surfing wetsuits because they get beat up. So a yeah. lot of people will just buy, you know, used ones. Most canyoneers use more of a surfing style because it's made for more movement. Mm. As where if you're like doing a, a scuba wetsuit, uh, they're usually a, a full thickness all the way through and they're a little bit stiffer. Uh, they're definitely warm, right? So you can get a five mil, um, a, a five mil diving wetsuit is a five mil all the way around, as where a five mil surfing is going to be a five four, mm. right? So in all the articulation and and in the arms, it's four mils. It sort of gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility. Are people doing dry suits down canyons? There are dry suits too. So uh, here in the Northwest, a lot of people use dry suits. They're great as long as they don't leak. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, so if you're in very cold weather, a dry suit is, is almost essential. The problem, especially with the group I found as there's a lot of sitting around. If, if yeah, you're the a passenger, large, the larger the group yeah. and you're waiting for everyone to get to the furthest point and then wait for that leader. If you're sitting around in wet, you're going to get cold. You can imagine having some water just fire hose mm -hmm. down. That's about mm -hmm. 40 degrees. Isn't going to feel <laughs> so good. So if you don't have a built-in hood, um, I bought one like this and I actually don't tuck it in. I wear it on the outside so water hits the back of my hood and stays on the outside. And that's how, again, I prevent that flushing from going through my wetsuit. So we were working on uh, canyon specific wetsuits. We're also working on adjusting some sizing to uh, fit canyoneers, male and female, better. And I'm uh, a lot shorter than my weight and a size uh, would be. So some wetsuits that fit me up here are a little long. So, gotcha. yeah. And what else makes a canyon wetsuit different than a surfer wetsuit? Similar to a diving wetsuit, you'd have the Farmer John and a jacket over. So you can have extra insulation, you know, in your core. But there's extra mobility um, and then extra reinforcements in the elbows and the knees. We're going to have built-in padding on the knees and shins and the elbows um, that are removable as well. Mm. Plus, we're going to have some uh, reinforcement uh, materials uh, on those uh, rub areas. Why do all of the canyoneering harnesses look like depends? It depends. No. <laughs> So because we are sliding, you know, we're climbing around. And so to one, to protect our wetsuits, okay. it has oh, a, yeah. a, usually a, a PVC um, built-in diaper. diaper, right? <laughs> um, what it is. And, uh, you know, but also like four slides or toboggans, like it'll help you slide um, up better. It also, it protects the waist and belt loops from getting more wear. I actually don't have my own canyon harness. If I wanted to just try out Canyon you know, on my own for once. Uh, could you go down with a climbing rope, an ATC, and a climbing harness? Yes, yes, and yes, but it depends. <laughs> I see what you did there. So yeah, I mean, you can repel in most instances with all the climbing gear that you already have. Okay. It just there's going to be variables that you may want to be more aware of. If it's a nylon rope, it's going to be stretchy. It's going to absorb a lot of water. It's right. Get heavy. It's going to get heavy. Um, and once you've used it for canyoning and canyoneering, repelling, you're not going to want to use it for reclimbing anymore. You, yeah, you could abuse it to the point where the dynamic properties, especially if that's what you're yeah, using. Yeah, it's, it's going to get to filled up with dirt and everything as well. So the gear will work, right? But it's there is specific gear designed for the sport of hand. And so... Brings us to... But these ropes, um, and a lot of canyon ropes we've found are getting uh, a little smaller and smaller over the last couple of years. Let's talk about length real quick. How long of a rope do I need to go down any canyon? It depends. Oh, I see a theme here. <laughs> the rule of thumb is if I'm going into a canyon and my biggest rappel is 100 feet, I'm going to want to carry three times that length. Why? Uh, because you never know what you may get into uh, and you may stick a rope. You may have to cut a rope. The only way that through way the down. canyon is to get down, <laughs> okay. right? So there's some canyons you may have an exit point, but if you're not at that exit point, then 
you got to keep going down. You need to have two ropes sometimes. You may have a traverse line mm -hmm. to reach out to the anchor. Because the most ideal place to be able to pull your rope and not be rubbing it against an edge while you repel is at the edge. Is at the, is at the edge. At the edge, right? So you could either have a small rope or you could access the other end of your rope, right? So if you know you have enough length mm -hmm. to incorporate the traverse line into your system, mm -hmm. then you have access to both ends of the line. And then there's times where you may need to access the other end of the rope for a rescue mm. or for some sort of, if you need to do a top belay. So there's still some rope in the system to lower somebody. Mm -hmm. And then I may still have enough rope to rescue you as might well. Have like, yeah. yeah, I mean, can I can put one of these down. Are they heavy? <laughs> are they only 8.5? This one's six pounds, this one's a little over six pounds, and this one's eight pounds. Are these all 70 meters? I don't know. Because I ordered gonna... a whole bunch of variety because everybody likes to have different things. We also sell it by the foot. I see a 70 meter on your tag right here. Yep. Oh, this is an 80 meter. Not too big for an 80 meter. Right. The spools come 200 meters, so that is the maximum length without a custom order that you could get from us. Canyon specific ropes have been polyester and Technora. Polyester is hydrophobic, it's static, it's fairly light. Technora is heat resistant, cut resistant. I've had some experience with Technora ropes and polyester ropes and polyester was not as hydrophobic as I wanted. Mm -hmm. Technora was not as abrasion resistant as I wanted. So you're trying to innovate Canyon ropes to be to the next level. Correct. And so you're trying to do different blends. Nothing here is 100% anything. Correct. We got some blend. So we were gonna have polyester cores and a Dyneema cores initially, um, and then polypropylene cores. So I had three different versions of all these different ropes. Okay. It was a mess. So then I found a core blend that I liked that was gonna work for all of my ropes, right? Whether you're gonna use them in the desert or aquatic. And so these have a polypropylene Dyneema core. So all three cores of these ropes are the same. Correct. They're right. polypropylene for the flotation. Correct. And Dyneema for the strength. Correct. And the outside and the is what makes them different. So this is the most affordable one you got. Correct. It's a similar price to the polyester polyester ropes that are on Correct. the market. Egress, which is our mostly polyester rope. So this would be kind of an economical entry level is HMPE and polyester. Okay. Uh, and then this one is HMPE, polyester, and Technora. And what's the, why did you decide to add Technora to this one? My original ropes of the Cascade was Technora and HMPE. And so I was trying to add color to the newt and I came up with a trident by accident. Okay. So I added polyester to the rope and it was only uh, basically 30% of the um, fibers, but it totally changed the uh, characteristics of what I was looking for. But it ended up being a great blend. Okay. Uh, it just wasn't what I was wanting to achieve with the newt. This is not Technora, the gray fibers. Correct. So I switched from Technora to Vectran because I found the Vectran has less creep. It's more static and it's more abrasion resistant. So it's similar to the HMPE, but it still has the characteristics to slow down the HMPE. HMPE is very slippery. You want it to be somewhat grippy. Yeah, you want to feel like you're in control, right? But I wanted a nice supple rope that was very light, absorbed minimal water. So Vectran absorbs uh, way less water than a Technora. And mm -hmm. so I found even once it breaks in, it doesn't get bloated and hold water. Which one floats the best, do you know? So this one, because it's the lightest overall, is gonna float the best. Which one is most abrasion resistant? Through various testings and, and um, feedback, the newt and the trident are pretty close, uh, but I feel the newt is more abrasion resistant and wears a lot better. We're gonna be testing on my abrasion tester and compare it to other ropes that are on the market as well. We're going to Test the crap out of everything. Talk about diameter. There's eight mil up to nine, nine, five on the market. We chose an eight, five as our main working line. One thing I've worked on is the consistency of the size. So like a nine mil could be like nine, four, nine, five, all over right? The place. And so these ones have been a little bit more consistent. This one is an eight, five, but because of its characteristics with the HMPE and Vectran, it rides more like an eight, an economical version of the newt. So it's gonna ride very similar okay. to the newt, but it's polyester. So it's not gonna be as durable. This one is an eight, five as well, but because of the characteristics of these fibers, it rides more like a nine. So if you're newer to the sport and want to experience a thinner rope, but not be worried about the amount of friction, you can go with the a trident 
there's more control, right? And it still breaks in well. And because of the weave, the um, Technorian here doesn't get too fuzzy and absorb too much water still. So we're in the middle of testing the new ropes that are here for uh, Ryan's store. So we're just gonna do a clove hitch on our carabiner for our static block. Make sure it's it goes on the spine. Nice and tight on the spine. Okay. That's a nice true clove hitch. Okay. We're gonna go through our wrap ring. Make sure the clove hitch is a bit against the wrap ring. Lock your carabiner. Okay. Now we're going to run this through our device. Lock that. Okay. So we're going to lock the device off. We're going to add some additional friction uh, ahead of time so that we have maximum friction when we take the lock off. So the lock isn't getting cinched down. Correct. Gotcha. So this lock, I'm going to come across just a loop through here, cross this over, a little half hitch onto that there. A single strand would save your life. Ah, oh, there you go. What helmet would I need when I go canyon? Can I just wear a climbing helmet? Some people will like a brim. So if you're in a C-class canyon, waterfall, water. a brim helps. But yeah, there's no real canyon specific helmets. What's up with the whole whistle thing? Is a way to communicate with the people above or below. The key thing with whistle signals is they change depending on who you talk to. So my recommendations... So talk to them before you need to... Yeah, so if you're going to have to set rope length, yeah. if there's potential where you're going to have to rescue me or whatever, discuss that ahead of time at top. Um, <laughs> then you can be on the same page. Because you could have raise the rope as three whistles. Okay. Or you could have lower the rope or lower the rope, right? Uh, or, you know, so it's just, it depends. So... I wasn't trying to plug this, but I realized there was a few times in Canyon. Yeah, so they, they maybe not on rappel when you're in the water. Though I'm not saying don't have a whistle. Right. But damn, these are waterproof, by the way. I mean, I have radios I've used. They've been handy at times. Situation I found this would have been really nice was uh, the first experienced person went down, and then you got all the newbies in the middle, and the Brent at the top. Couldn't, didn't have eyes on the person down there and someone was in the middle and they were kind of having an issue and there's no way they were going to communicate either way. The whistle wasn't going to do it, right. but they were away from the noise. They would have been able to hear, yeah. he would have been able to hear, Right. but it's an option. So there's a couple of specific Canyon boots out there by different companies. They're probably the most two common are the Adidas Hydrolasis, if you can find them. Yeah, yeah, they're very hard to they're get. Very, so Adidas, is they discontinued them, they brought them back, just, you know, and so... They're hard to find. Bestards is another one. They're a little bit more reliable in getting them. They're a little bit more expensive as well. Some people really like them. Do you drill holes in the sides of your shoes for this? I, <laughs> do I you... don't. So like the Hydro Laces don't drain. They don't. Right? And so there's benefits to that. With cold water, having everything all contained in there with your, your neoprene booty kind of keeps your feet warm. My feet have never gotten cold in my Hydro Laces. It's like the wetsuit. It keeps yeah, the water in, yeah. warms up the water that's in there. In the Northwest, um, a lot of, you can have a variety of, of attraction issues in the Northwest. So you just want to have a, a boot or a shoe that is grip use. I've seen people just have accidents and a really horrible experience using regular, you know, hiking shoes in a canyon. Because it's just, it just, it's just, it's a climbing, slippery. not a climbing shoe, but uh, like an approach shoe with climbing rubber on so it. So I've used approach shoes a number of times. Okay. So especially in the desert, that's used a lot. Northwest or a C class, they work, but just know they're going to get wet, right? So you got to okay. dry them out. And, you know, so they're going to be broken down a lot faster than normal. What could you practice to shit test yourself on whether or not you're ready for a problem? Because eventually you have a problem. Yeah. So if you got to look at what the situation is, right? So when would I need to self-rescue? If you're on a rappel and you get stuck for some reason, whether it's a shirt, your hair, whatever, in that point, you have to offload the device, right? Yeah. So you got to get on the rope. So learning how to 
get stuck at home. Yeah, get off of a very strong tree branch. Yeah. This high off the ground. Yeah. And see if you can get it fix that before you're in a waterfall. Explain to people who have never had a inversion in a rappel. What is that? So that's when your head goes below your butt and your feet are up in the air. Can't you just flip back over? You can. You have to flip back over one Eventually. way or another. Eventually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. But depending on the flow, depending on how you're rigged, depending on if you have a backpack on, sometimes that's easier or harder than others. <laughs> I was legitimately stuck on rope, upside down, and that was so difficult that I couldn't get out of it until I dumped my pack, and luckily was able to turn around to get back to my blocking device to stand back up before I could even move. So if the water was just a little bit stronger than that, which is not that strong, I would have been stuck there until somebody came and got me. Not a fun experience. If you're actually in the flow, if there's a little bit of an overhang, right, and, you, or you, and you're and you in the bubble behind or the little opening behind the waterfall, then it's not that bad. But if you're actually getting waterboarded, then it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, the problem is the water's actually waterboarding. Yeah, yeah. Um, you just don't want to get stuck in those situations without being prepared. Yeah. I think it's like there was, uh, so, I mean, see, so you can practice those things, right? So, like... I saw a video where um, they were in a, I mean, like in a shallow river, right? And so you can be a tied in in a shallow river, have someone anchored up above, mm. right? And you invert your rough self in, in the water. I mean, you just practice those essential things. Yeah. And something to practice is rigging releasable. If you're an anchor manager, you can lower that person who's struggling if you've rigged in advance for it. And it's good to practice that on both ends, right? So it's good to practice being the person, the anchor uh, manager, lowering somebody. And it's also good to practice being lowered because you're literally like are trusting the person to lower you. Yeah. And and it's a weird feeling. It's a weird feeling, it's right? It's a weird feeling when I'm trying to be very carefully how I land on this uh, hazard, whether it's a rock as it splashes in, and then Brent's lowering me. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to move now. Right. It's and you may weird, not have to, right? Yeah. It's a weird it, feeling. I mean, it's super weird. And you're just yeah. like, whistles. And so you want to be able to practice that and get used to it before it's an emergency. Kind of a random question. It's good to know. Uh, usually when you get a backpacking permit, they tell you to not pee within 200 feet of a water source. And then you go with canyoneers. <laughs> and it's like, what's ethical and what do people do? Um, There's two different things. It's unethical to not pee in the water in a cave or it stays in there forever, right? right? You, you right. want it to get out of the cave. It's interesting right. that the ethics and, and the zooming out big picture of like impact is peeing in the same spot in Dingford that never gets washed away and smells like piss better than being like, this goes somewhere, but I'll piss in it anyways. It's me personally, I would rather go I guess in the water because it's going to get washed out anyway, right? So if you're even if you're peeing next to the river and the high flows, it's going to be now you're you know causing erosion or something, right? Or but so I don't know. That's that's a good question. All I know is there's two kinds of people. I mean, have you heard this one? I mean, there's a lot of jokes that start that way. <laughs> there's people that pee in their wetsuit and the people that deny it. Right? <laughs> Carry it out with you. Pee in your wetsuit. So when I take uh, groups out, that's one thing we talk about. What, bringing a water filter? <laughs> that's why you always filter your water, because you never know what's upstream. Yeah, there's could be a team. Right? Two repels before you pissing in the water. So I'm trying to really bridge the gap between somebody who knows a little bit or nothing about ropes to uh, being able to be a good partner to somebody who is knows what they're doing when you go canyoning. It's nice if you show up and you already know a bunch of the lingo, how things work, and you're not just like super green. If this stuff helps you, let us know. If this can be more helpful to you in a certain way, let us know how. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah thanks for sharing all this stuff. And we'll be, uh... I don't want to use rubbing and tugging. God damn it. <laughs> Maybe that's just a really funny <laughs> phrase. We'll also be doing more and more tests on these specific ropes. And uh, I think he has another one coming out soon. So. We'll be testing that. It'll all be on the website. It'll all be in the Canyon Rope Systems. We'll reference all this. Um, so thanks for watching. And uh, thank you. See you next time.